an acknowledgement of our access to digital technology and use of ESPN's platform for direct-to-consumer access. And we'll still have access to ESPN's many platforms, including the SEC network, and in 24, again, when in fully effect, we will be able to announce more game times earlier, like in the summer, so that our fans and our schools have the ability to plan well in advance of the season. In March of this year, our women's basketball student athletes and coaches, coaches were rightly outraged about the inequities that became apparent around the NCAA tournament in San, in, in San Antonio. On June 21st, the Supreme Court issued its decision in the Alston case, making it clear that the status quo in college athletics is not an option. And on July 1st, student athletes began their activity around name, image, and likeness opportunity. All of that illustrates our reality that we must change. But as we think about change, we must also remember that not everything is broken around college sports. We need a reminder about the many positive realities that don't receive full or accurate attention. Because we need to work, we need to understand what's, what works well and what needs to be sustained as we look towards a future in this expectation of change. So let's start with the Olympics. According to the United States Olympic Committee and Paralympic Committee, there are 613 United States Olympians. 463 of those had a college athletics experience. And that will include 80 current or former SEC student athletes, and we're one of three conferences where all 14 of our universities will be represented, represented uh, by at least one Olympian. And there's not a football player among that group. Our national college sports system makes that happen. If you change college sports, you change our Olympic development and support system in this country. When we were faced with the economic fallout from a revised schedule, a delayed start, reduced fans, reduction in ticket sales, we didn't back away from our responsibilities. In fact, we as a conference stepped up. In the SEC, we did not have any sports dropped or discontinued in our athletics programs. And well before there was an NCAA rule introduced, our conference acted to assure those student athletes who decided to opt out of playing that they would retain their financial scholarship through their athletics program. The result was we had 185 student athletes opt out who enjoyed that support from their university. And while we're talking about accurate data around college athletics, understand that our student athletes don't go hungry. There are no limits around the nutritional support provided to our student athletes. There's also been misrepresentations of what happens when a student athlete is injured. Understand, when a young person enrolls on our campuses to participate in college athletics, they, as a matter of standard practice, go through advanced medical screenings. The reality is young people have maladies detected through that process that for the first time are frequently treated. And when we have injuries in college sports, our student athletes have access to world-class physicians and the best rehabilitation support. And when a student athlete is injured and no longer able to participate in their chosen sport, our universities willingly provide support under the NCA's medical exemption category. And last year, that included financial support to 100, 105 student athletes in this league. In addition to the financial support provided to student athletes who are injured, unable to participate, or opted to not participate, we had 127 student athletes supported by SEC athletics departments whose eligibility was complete before they completed their undergraduate degree. They were welcomed back willingly by our programs, not because of a rule or government mandate, because that's how we care for young people. And in any year, there are more than 5,400 student athletes supported through an athletic scholarship in the Southeastern Conference. Of that group, we saw 67% of our teams 
access national championship postseason tournaments or playoffs. We had eight different, uh, excuse me, we had eight different universities with nine teams earning national championships. So I'll clarify that. What that means is more than half of our universities, eight, celebrated their own national championship moment since January of this year. The SEC produced 12 players of the year from our 21 sports. We had the NCAA Woman of the Year, a National Football Foundation Scholar Athlete, two Honda Sport Award winners, and I could go on with a list of individual accolades. And this happened because we tried when it was difficult. And it happens because of the world-class support provided to offer incredible athletic and educational experiences in the Southeastern Conference. To make what happened last year take place, we had to create a conference-wide COVID testing program. That involved a third-party logistics and medical support team. It included nearly 350,000 COVID tests. About 340,000 were lab-based PCR. That was our standard through the week, through every sport, regardless of the season. Another 10,000 rapid antigen tests. Right now, 43% of our football teams, that's six of 14, have reached the 80% threshold in roster vaccination. That number needs to grow and grow rapidly. We have learned how to manage through a COVID environment, but we do not yet have control of the COVID environment. And that finds us preparing to return towards normal this fall. But we see realities around us. Olympians are removed from participation because of positive COVID tests. The Yankees Red Sox game last Friday was postponed. And sadly, our colleagues at North Carolina State weren't able to continue the competition in the College, Ser College World Series, which we cherish competition, particularly at that time of the year. But each reminds us of the need to be vigilant about our health. Let me be clear to our fans, to our coaches, to our staff members, and to our student athletes. COVID-19 vaccines are widely available. They've proven to be highly effective. And when people are fully vaccinated, we all have the ability to avoid serious health risks, reduce the virus's spread, and maximize our chances of returning to a normal college football experience and to normal life. With six weeks to go before kickoff, now is the time to seek that full vaccination. And we know nothing is perfect, but the availability and the efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccines, vaccines are an important and incredible product of science. Not a political football, and we need to do our part to support a healthy society. Because as we look back, the potential absence of college sports last year caused us to think about not losing sight of the lifelong experiences, the laboratory of learning that takes place, and the educational benefits that accrue to the people who participate on our teams. But just like every human endeavor, College athletics is not perfect. And you know the criticisms. Many of you have likely written those criticisms. And as leaders, we have a responsibility to improve our attention to genuinely ad identifying, addressing, and resolving the lingering issues. Not everyone's going to be pleased, and change takes time. However, if we understand both the strengths of college sports and the key areas to be addressed, we can work towards effective solutions. But let's leave the legislative issues and the COVID issues for just a few moments. We now have William Tate leading LSU as the SEC's first African-American president or chancellor. We have African-American athletics directors. We have head coaches in men's basketball and in women's basketball from underrepresented groups. 
Yet after hiring eight new head football coaches in the past two years in the SEC, we have no underrepresented group leading one of, our head foot, one of our football programs. We have no head coaches from underrepresented groups. It's a reality that has changed before and it must change again. So in early June, our presidents and chancellors approved a new initiative to establish an expectation for athletics department hiring processes around key leadership roles, athletics directors, senior women administrators, and head coaches. And while employment decisions are made not by the conference office, but by our campuses and their athletics departments, this change will bring a collaborative expectation where when these openings appear, we'll be in communication, sharing information about potentially viable candidates from historically underrepresented groups. To make certain our member institutions are fulfilling their expectations under this new policy each year, we'll be expected to provide a written certification to the commissioner about their efforts to include diverse candidates in their finalist pool, and we'll share this information with you a bit later today. But as times change, we find ourselves not celebrating first, down, first downs, touchdowns, or championships. Instead, we talk about litigation, about legislation, and about lobbying. We are in a transformative time, perhaps the most transformative time in the entire history of college sports. And there must be recognition that this transformation can't come from a set of siloed decisions. We have to understand the connection, the nuances, the implications, and the unimagined outcomes associated with decisions. So let's start first with a continuing point of criticism, and that's the economics of college sports. However, as we adjust to different economic expectations around college sports activity, we all must understand the reality associated with whatever direction emerges. As I talked about a moment ago, will there be a college-based Olympic development and support system? Will opportunities be reduced as our colleges and universities slim down their sports offerings? What's to be done with existing contractual, financial, and facility commitments? If a new economic model is to be imposed or created, how do we continue to maintain a focus on improving educational outcomes, maintaining widespread interest in supporting broad-based programs? And how do we adjust college sports within the boundaries of antitrust law? Earlier, I mentioned a small piece of medical support for our student athletes and made that specific to how we function. But a few years ago, the Autonomy Five conferences adopted an expectation, a requirement, that two years after a student athlete's participation, our universities provide medical support through financial support for those student athletes two years after they departed. Is that the right healthcare expectation for college athletics? If not, how should it change? Is it length of time? Is it substance of support? And even as more young people graduate from our programs, how do we meaningfully foster career transition? We have programs at the conference office to help facilitate that. How do we expand that? How do our campuses perhaps become more intentional and have more flexibility at facilitating that career transition? What attention is owed to transfers who seek a greener pasture but instead lose their scholarship opportunity? This year's transfer portal had over 1,600 FBS scholarship recipients enter. There are still 1,100 active in that portal. Across all Division I sports, over 13,000 entered and over 11,000 still remain. There's not enough information for me to explain that data, but we have a responsibility to dig deeper because it's not good enough just to provide flexibility. We have to understand the impacts of our decision making. We also have to understand how to support an environment that provides more flexibility, permits legitimate transfers while holding to account those who tamper and want to turn college rosters into their personal recruiting grounds. In December, I sent a lengthy letter to the NCAA Division I Council. 
My purpose was to identify and make observations around the NCA's enforcement and, and infractions process that I felt had to be addressed sooner rather than later. And in each observation, I offered at least some form of suggestion to help guide us forward. Perhaps not perfect suggestions, but something to be considered. Because we need to be clear, those accused of violations deserve a fair and timely outcome. And those who compete against those accused of violations deserve that same fair and timely outcome. And the national process for accountability must focus on issues of primary importance with cases resolved in the most timely manner possible. And it's easy, in fact, I've been at fault. It's easy to criticize the NCA. It's an organization of over a thousand different institutions at three different divisional levels. In Division I, there are 351 campuses, 32 conferences. That's a difficult role. But I was pleased by President Emmert's call to reconsider the responsibilities of the National Office of Conferences and of Campuses. While not knowing the path forward, we desire this necessarily, necessarily, necessary dialogue as it remains important for college athletics to have an effective governing body. We have to move forward producing legally defensible, relevant results and regulations. We must recognize the expectations, demands, and pressures that are present on the campuses of this conference are not uniform across all of Division I. And expecting every conference to come together to debate, discuss, and produce effective decisions for everyone is not our modern reality. We must begin to adapt. And as we witness real-time adaptation to the new name, image, and likeness environment, our athletics programs are already properly supporting student athletes within the boundaries and expectations of state laws or of executive order. It's a complex task that's made challenging because everyone is operating according to different state laws. But the NCAA's temporary rules governing name, image, and likeness were a necessary reality. But those interim policies are no substitute for a uniform national standard. While we, we all will benefit from a standard that supports the interests of student athletes while pre preventing exploitive practices. With policies that can be understood and administered by university universities and colleges at every level, while also providing prospective student athletes with clarity as they are recruited nationally across state lines and have to understand the different name, image, and likeness laws. Because state laws are either inconsistent or non-existent, the NCA rules can no longer resolve key issues. We need a federal solution. We understand it's difficult to gather the support for such federal legislation. However, congressional action is necessary if we're gonna provide every student a clear, consistent, and fair opportunity to benefit from their name, image, and likeness. The Southeastern Conference and our member universities are ready to engage in the collaborative problem-solving effort with all of college, sp college sports major stakeholders. Our present reality highlights the need for a national dialogue on what is expected of college sports, be it healthcare, educational certainty, career transition, examining the economics, or myriad other issues. We in the SEC are dedicated to the shared values of higher education and high level collegiate athletics competition while ensuring the unifying traditions and spirit of college sports remain interwoven into our nation's campuses and our communities. And we must now take the additional step of ensuring student athletes are provided with modern and reimagined opportunities to benefit from their participation in college sports. Let me again say thank you 
for everyone who made it possible for us to be here today. Thank you for your flexibility since that date in March of 2020, when everything was going to Zoom, you remember people weren't happy that we created that distance, but we did things that we had to do to make possible what we achieved. Our staff is here and ready to help through the remaining days. As is our tradition, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin, but I'm going to leave you with this one last reminder. The times are changing. It's not simply a song lyric, it's a reality. It is an uncomfortable reality, but that's how progress is made. Through it all, I remain convinced in the Southeastern Conference, our best days are still ahead. So Kevin, I'm going to grab a drink real quick, and I'm going to throw it to you. Thank you, Commissioner. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We have Savannah, Riley, and AJ. We'll bring a microphone to you. Again, if you'll please stand, give your name and affiliation um, when the microphone gets to you. So we're going to start right over here on my left, uh, about three quarters of the way back. Please stand, give your name and affiliation. Right. Uh, Seth Emerson with The Athletic. Greg, uh, last year, with the postponements and moving around games, especially football, is that something that will not happen this year? Will you simply go, if, it, if a team cannot play, will they have a no contest or a forfeit? What, um, so let's just indicate like the realities we deal with. You, know, you hope not to have disruption, but hope is not a plan is the great cliche. We still have roster minimums that exist, just like last year. What I've identified for consideration among our membership is we remove those roster minimums and you're expected to play as scheduled. That means your team needs to be healthy to compete. And if not, that game won't be rescheduled. And thus, to dispose of the game, the forfeit word comes up at this point. That's not a policy and what you see are the bookends now for decision making. We've not built in the kind of time we did last year, particularly at the end of the season to accommodate disruption. And unless we're going to do that, our teams are gonna to have to be fully prepared to play their season as scheduled, which is why embedded in my remarks is the vaccination motivation. Good morning, Commissioner uh, Jacques Doucet, WFB TV in Baton Rouge. Um, it's viewed that some SEC schools have a competitive and recruiting advantage over others because there is no uniform drug policy. Would the SEC benefit from a uniform drug policy? We've talked about that issue for years, and I'll give you credit because I don't think I've had that question like three or four years. So there's a set of things that usually happen in Destin. That's, that's one of them. As Ross Dellinger knows, the alcohol question was always there, so that was his task. Um, we, we, which, which is not linked to your question, by the way, so I want to draw the, the distinction between the legal and the illegal. We've, we've not gone back into that conversation. Our member universities have felt it appropriate to allow each campus to make its own decisions around drug policy. Um, our, our, our universities have policies that extend even beyond their athletics program, so it's not been a point of conversation. We'll go down here to our left, second row, Ron. Yeah, uh, Ron Higgins, uh, TigerRagMagazine.com. With, with all the changes in college athletics, with the NIL and, and players transfer rule and whatever, yeah, our, our college commission was closer than, say, five years ago until, especially the Power Five conferences, conferences into, into splitting all, off into their own little country, so to speak. I don't know where, well, I guess it was commissioner five years ago. It's been a long time. You tried to give me a day off and then you throw that one at me on social media. No, I, I, that's not the focus. I, I went through a list of observations that aren't just NCA related, they are college athletics related. Th that's actually us. And, and some ideas, in fact, ideas that I've had actually don't resolve issues. They just linger. Um, and so are we closer? N not in my imagination. Um, I, I do think we all have to be mindful of the reality in front of us. And as I noted, when uh, President Emmert spoke about the need for change and reimagining the national office role, the conference role, and the campus role, that doesn't speak to your question, but it does speak to we're going to have to administer this differently. Uh, that's likely the next process. Yet, Ron, I think people are going to be asking that question of me. 
I think within our programs, people will ask that question of me. I think nationally, people will ask that question of me. But it doesn't predict that kind of, of outcome at this point. We'll stay in the same session about four rows back, right? Me. John Talty, AL.com. Greg, you said we need a federal solution. I guess what, if anything, gives you the confidence that Congress can actually deliver a solution to these issues? All I can do is keep asking and making the case for why it's necessary. And uh, I've learned over the last two years I should have, I should have paid much more attention in, in high school civics because I'm learning much. You know, the, the schoolhouse rock, I'm just the bill video was like my expertise and it's magnified. There is no assurance. Um, I, I, I hope, and I've testified once, I've met, I've had conversations, to provide some education and perspective about what that national standard would mean. Um, we've also, and I've said here, are willing to discuss other aspects that may be on congressional leaders' minds. I don't know that we can resolve every one of them through federal legislation, nor, nor given the level of care we provide, do I think every element needs to be regulated. I do think every element needs to be understood. So John, do I have assurance? Can I predict an outcome? I cannot. And if that's where we are, um, we're gonna be dealing with this tension. We're gonna learn a lot. Obviously we have in the last, what, three weeks. We'll learn a lot in the next three months. And uh, we'll see how that guides us if in fact there is no federal legislation. But think about some elements that I mentioned. Start with a prospective student athlete who's recruited by our, our universities. That's gonna be somebody recruited nationally. How, how do they and their family understand what name, image, and likeness policies are gonna apply upon their collegiate enrollment? States are all different or they don't have anything and they've just been given permission. So some level of institutional policy uh, provides. When you examine state legislation, there's not a high level of oversight. And, and I just read on Twitter some really high number of, of businesses that are now in this space. Yeah, there are businesses that are well-intentioned that will support young people, but outside our league, at, at different levels, I've heard of young people walking into compliance offices with contracts that say, pay so-and-so $5,000, they'll create your brand and your website, or $10,000 or $15,000. That's not this one-sided flow of money that everyone expects. So how do we oversee this properly? And if the outcome of the Alston case is we have to be less restrictive in NCA rules, then we're back in this conversation about Congress. And that, that's the difficulty of being a conference commissioner, an athletics director, or a compliance coordinator right now. And I will give you a point of, of praise because you asked a question that was actually really important last July at this time. End of Paul's show, and congratulations to Paul on a contract extension being announced. You asked, why are we trying to play college football? And you provided me lack of sleep that night because that's the kind of question that should have been asked and actually worked with a lot of people to try to answer why we needed some clarity. And, and hopefully uh, people are convinced we did it well, we did it right, and it was uh, an appropriate step. And I'm not blaming it on you, John, but I just give you credit for raising an issue that cost me some sleep to try to figure out a path forward a year ago. Hey, Greg, Jared Joseph with Fox 44 in Baton Rouge. You talked about COVID and the need for vaccination, but as cases continue to rise in different parts of the country, are you coordinating with other schools? For example, with LSU season opener against UCLA and the county reinstating a mask mandate, what are the conversations like as far as attendance and roster management goes? Uh, a couple aspects. One, there still is communication among the conferences, particularly the five conferences and our medical leaders. That began last May, was incredibly beneficial, and will continue now. Our campuses who are traveling to those non-conference games are gonna be in communication with the host and the host community to understand what policies will apply. Chicago, for example, um, had a no vaccination, out-of-state travel limitation on the states of Missouri and Arkansas announced last week. Um, what we'll see, I expect, is municipalities and, and public health officials, perhaps at the state level, continuing to adjust, which brings me back to the mantra of last year, which is we're gonna prepare to play the season as scheduled. And, and I'm, I'm convinced we'll move forward to the Labor Day weekend start, unlike last year, 
but we will have to adapt to the circumstances of, of COVID-19, of the virus. That's where I talk about we know how to manage through, but we don't have control of the COVID environment. Okay, we'll go to the far back left side of the room. Pardon me for not getting up, Commissioner. That's okay. We're, we're, we've got a strong enough relationship to understand each other. <laughs> now I don't have to stand and salute. I, I appreciate that. No one's done that yet, by the way. They should. Um, given President Emmert's comments and uh, about many responsibilities falling more and more on the conferences at the conference level, um, will that include enforcement? What is the current status of NCA enforcement? And given nobody seems to know exactly what the rules are until they're hashed out, is there still even a working enforcement staff? Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, in the midst of trying to make observations to move the process forward, Cecil, um, I, I've communicated in, in meetings and in settings, I think highly of John Duncan, the NCA's president of enforcement. That's an incredibly difficult role. And the enforcement staff has a difficult role. Uh, so let's just take a step back. Let's understand in 2018, the Commission on College Basketball introduced a new process, an independent review process. That process hasn't reduced outcomes from arrests made by the FBI in September of 2017. And some of those acts of alleged wrongdoing occurred back in 2016. So we're now five years removed without outcomes. We need outcomes, particularly from those high profile matters. Uh, the, the enforcement staff, the Committee on Infractions are still active because we have had uh, matters resolved. I think there was one announced last week, didn't involve this conference. But we need to readjust our expectations. And if you look over time, there have been a set of individual working groups that have introduced change. So the Commission on College Basketball most recently, the enforcement working group 10 years ago, there was a Duff report, there was a Lee Commission. How do those all connect? And the rhetoric around what we need is more aggressive penalties, I would argue doesn't work. What would work more effectively might be reduced penalties, but specific time expectations to implement those penalties while slimming down the focus to that which is of primary concern for the support of college athletics. I'll give an illustration. High school coach, or excuse me, a college coach who walks into a high school and has a conversation with a high school junior. We've had universities spend six figures defending coaches in that. We've had potential head coach suspensions for an interaction. If we want to foster a college going culture through college athletics, why wouldn't we allow those conversations to take place in football? They can take place in, in different ways in basketball. Stop spending time, the opportunity cost associated with that enforcement and focus on the primary issues. So yes, there is a role, incredibly hard job. I have a lot of respect for those leading in that work, uh, but we have to have timely outcomes, particularly in high profile matters. And I spoke of fair and timely, which I think is a two way street in this process. Okay. Brandon Marcello, 24-7 Sports. Uh, Commissioner, you talk about a lot of these changes that need to be made and making, trying to make progress on that, but with so many different voices in the room and trying to get everybody on the same page, one, how do you get to that point where you get everybody in the same room and start making progress? And secondly, is there also an onus on, say, the commissioners and, for that matter, the university presidents who maybe haven't been as vocal as we have seen some commissioners? I'm not convinced you can put everyone in a room and have the needed outcomes. It doesn't mean everyone's just detached, but it may be that we have to first identify the principles for change. That informs some elements of change that brings about a process for change. As I said, I don't know the path forward we have a responsibility, and almost to Cecil's question, as things are delegated, you take enforcement. 
you know, we had an investigator 20 years ago or 15 years ago, probably, or 17 years ago is when it stopped because it did, didn't work effectively. The PAC-12 had its own process, kind of double jeopardy, that's gone away. So, so there are roles in answering your question directly. I think some high level thought focused on specific elements is at the core of this. And we can add, but we're not gonna solve every problem and be able to legislate college athletics programs through the NCAA manual. We can govern some aspects, but 450 pages seems less relevant today than it ever has before. All right, thank you for your time, Commissioner. We'll be back uh, with our first coach, Tom I'll be back for my introductions, which I know you all cherish. You missed them last July.